Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to today's webinar. This is the second webinar in a series about FIGO's postpartum IUD initiative. Today's webinar will focus on three country perspectives on improving access to quality postpartum family planning services. Next slide. My name is Nandita Tate, and I lead the IBP network that is housed at WHO based in Geneva, Switzerland. I will be your moderator today, and I'm very excited about today's webinar. Next slide. We have a very full program today. We will hear first from esteemed professor, uh, Sir Sabranatham Arul Kumaran. Uh, then we will have a series of presentations. First, uh, Dr. Anita Mackins will present an overview on the global perspective of the initiative. Then we will hear from Dr. Hema Divakar from India, followed by Dr. Benjamin Odongo Eli from Kenya, and finally, Professor Parveen Fatima from Bangladesh. We will have some time for questions and answers at the end as well. Next slide. Before we begin, just a reminder that today's webinar will be recorded and you will be able to download the recording both at the FIGO website listed there, as well as on the WHO HRP YouTube media channel. Also, remember you can submit your questions at any time during the presentations using the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. So you can type your question in there and we will get to them at the end. Finally, please check out the handouts. You can download the number of handouts uh, again on the right-hand side of your panel. Next. Okay, with that, I, I am honored to introduce Professor Sir Sabranatham Arul Kumaran. Uh, Professor Arul, as, we, as he's known, uh, is a former president of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists and the former president of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. He is also a longtime member of the HRP Scientific Technical Advisory Group and was appointed to the Knight Bachelor in 2009 for his service in medicine. Professor, we're happy to have you with us. I turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you, Nandita, for the kind introduction and for chairing this meeting. We are most grateful to you. Uh, good morning to all the panelists and the participants. And it's very nice to see so many of you participating in this FIGO postpartum intrauterine device initiative. As we of introduction, the project was started in 2013 with the aim of reducing the maternal mortality as the targets set for MDG5 were not met by many countries. The research showed that 30% reduction in maternal mortality can be achieved by contraception alone, possibly greater reduction in countries with higher maternal mortality and less contraception. The governments in these countries are focusing on enhanced institutional deliveries to reduce consequences of the three delay model and to provide skilled maternity care to reduce maternal mortality. However, contraception was not offered because of the cost and the doubt about acceptability, effectiveness and side effects of affordable methods such as copper IUD. We were also concerned that in these countries, surgical sterilization of young women was the mode for contraception instead of offering long-acting reversible contraceptives. We thought our goal should be reduction of maternal mortality and birth spacing. So after establishing the pilot project in Sri Lanka to demonstrate acceptability, affordability, effectiveness with minimal side effects, the project institutionalized of postpartum IUD was expanded to six countries in 48 hospitals. Last week, you heard some innovative ways of implementing this initiative of on-the-job training from Dr. Kusum Thapa from Nepal, pre-service training from Professor Projestin Muyangani from Tanzania, and getting a poll of the obstetricians to make it a government policy in Sri Lanka from Dr. Ratnashiri. And Dr. Anita Makins, our director of the program, gave an overview of the whole program. Today's program will cover different aspects of task sharing, the use of community health workers and quality counseling. 
This project is coming to an end after we achieved our goals and the offer of acceptance of PPU IUD has become sustainable and reproducible, not only in the six centers, but in the whole countries where we implemented this project. The seminars as webinar could provide information as to how this project was successfully implemented and made sustainable. I'd like to thank the anonymous donors on behalf of FIGO for the generous grant provided to carry out this initiative over the last seven years and the PPIUD team for their tireless effort in making this initiative a success, both at FIGO and at country level. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor. Before we dive into the presentations, we want to know more about who we have with us on the line. So we are going to do a quick poll. Uh, next, you will see a series of you will see a question, you should see a question on your screen. Uh, so please take a minute and share with us why you are joining today's webinar. I'll read them out. Uh, the primary reason I'm joining today's webinar is I'm a practitioner interested to learn more about PPIUD. I'm a student and this webinar is required for me. I am joining as a professional development activity. The webinar time is convenient for me. I'm interested in developing PPIUD services in my practice. So please go ahead and select one as the main reason that we have you with us. And we will be able to show the results on the screen in a couple of seconds. Okay, great. And I think we see the results. Wonderful. Well, it is great to see sort of a range of, of folks joining us today. We have a lot of practitioners interested to learn more about PPIUD. We have a number of people joining as professional development activities and others uh, interested in, in PPIUD in general um, and students. So thank you all for joining. We're really happy to have you with us. And with that, we will go to the next slide and Again, would like to just welcome today's presenters. Uh, we'll be going, we'll be providing a little bit more of an introduction before they each present. But again, thank you to all of you for joining and taking time out of your schedule to share your country experience with us today. Next slide. I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Anita Mackins, who's the FIGO PPIUD director. Uh, Dr. Mackins is consultant, obstetrician, and gynecologist, and women's public health expert, and she's currently the director of the PPIUD initiative at FIGO. Anita, I turn it over to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, um, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, so I'm going to be talking about giving a bit of an overview of, of the PPIUD initiative and telling you why we think it's a global opportunity to um, address the unmet need for contraception. Um, so uh, I'm the director of the FIGO project. So FIGO, for those who don't know, is the International Federation of uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We have 132 member societies. Um, we're dedicated to the improvement of women's health and rights. Uh, just to say this talk is uh, similar to the one that was done last week. Um, but the subsequent three talks are new. So if you did listen to it last week, apologies for the slight repetitiveness, but please stay on to listen to the, the next three talks. We thought it was important to give an, an overview. So if we could pass on to the next slide, please. So many of you may be aware of this data. So it was produced by Guttmacher in 2017, showing that 240 million women have an unmet need for contraception. Um, and when you talk to ladies who are within 12 months of giving birth, 95% of them um, said that they didn't want a, a pregnancy a, over the next couple of years, but yet 70% of them were not using contraception. Um, so a huge unmet need in the postpartum period. And we think that's 
uh, mainly due to, to access services, access to services being limited. The graph on the right uh, shows uh, the unmet need uh, over time from the 70s and sort of projected into the future. You can see the disparities, regional disparities with Africa being the, the region of the world with the highest unmet need. Um, and if you look at the black line, which represents the world overall, you can see that really since 20, uh, 2010, 2015, it's plateaued out. So we haven't really um, gained much ground in reducing the unmet need. Next slide, please. So um, some of you may be aware, so this report, uh, the picture on the right is from the Saving Mothers Lives report. And what it pointed out was that family planning provision alone has the potential to reduce maternal mortality by 30% because it's preventative. So you're addressing all causes. So you're addressing um, unsafe abortion or um, maternal mortality due to obstetric emergencies, hemorrhages and, and so on. So really very effective intervention to reduce maternal mortality. Next slide, please. So this slide is showing us uh, the adverse outcomes that are related to um, short birth spacing. So the graph on the left um, is comparing women who had birth spacing of less than 18 months compared to those who waited to have another pregnancy between 24 and 60 months. And you can see there that the adjust, adjusted odds ratio for having a baby which is small for gestational age, a preterm uh, birth, uh, and even infant mortality is, is higher um, in that shorter birthing spacing interval. So a higher risk pregnancy um, if you don't birth space adequately. And the graph on the right um, is, by, is produced from uh, Rustain. So he uh, was pulled together demographic health surveys across, I think, something like 40, 40 odd uh, low middle income countries. And what they demonstrated was that there's a direct correlation between the interval months um, between pregnancies and the chances of a child uh, being alive and not undernourished. So the longer, the, the greater the, the time between pregnancies, the more likely uh, the child would be alive and, and not undernourished. So unsurprisingly, the WHO recommends uh, 24 months uh, between pregnancies. Next slide, please. So then the question could be, well, you know, why, why PPIUD? Why did FIGO focus on PPIUD? Well, firstly, because it made sense in terms of capitalizing on the increased institutional deliveries, which um, have, have happened and, and happened with the Millennium Development Goals. Um, secondly, because it's WHO medical eligibility criteria one, which means that there aren't really many contraindications other than a, a septic uterus or chorioamnionitis or if the lady was having a heavy bleed. But bar that, it doesn't have the same concerns that some of the hormonal contraception, contraceptive methods have. Thirdly, it's long acting and it's a reversible method. Um, it's highly cost effective. And this will be the subject of the third webinar next week. Um, it's also uh, a very sort of efficient process, so it can be a relatively painless uh, one-stop procedure. If the lady has been counselled antenatally, given her consent, then after the baby's born and the placenta has come out, it can be inserted immediately afterwards. Next slide, please. So to say also that, you know, during the current times of the COVID pandemic, PPIUD has become even more uh, valuable, I would say. So this is a statement uh, published by the Committee on Contraception and FIGO's Committee on Contraception and, and Family Planning in April. And they outlined six key steps um, that we should be paying attention to in terms of um, to ensure access to contraception during the pandemic. And the number one recommendation was really to expand postpartum family planning services, because that obstetric encounter when the lady comes in to give uh, birth is a one-off opportunity to provide, um, to provide contraception. And obviously with the PPIUD not needing a return for supplies and so on, it becomes incredibly, incredibly um, relevant and useful. It's the subject actually of one of the editorials that we produced recently for the IJGO. I think it's in your handouts, so you can access that if you're interested. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of our implementation, so we started, Professor Arrow has already outlined in 2013 in Sri Lanka um, with the pilot project. Um, and then in 2015, we moved uh, to work in, to, in, in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Tanzania, and Kenya. This phase two was a much more intensive um, sort of set up, but also data collection so that we could analyze uh, the safety of it and, 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 and how we um, progressed. And then the third phase, which is the one we're in now, which has, has been the sustainability phase, so ensuring that um, uh, when FIGO, the FIGO initiative leaves these countries, that they will still be continuing to offer PPFP and PPIUD services. So our aim was to institutionalize the practice of antenatal counseling in postpartum family planning, and that's all available methods uh, of postpartum family planning, and then um, teaching them also to insert PPIUD um, in those uh, women who had consented to, to have the method. So we worked across 48 uh, referral hospitals with large maternity units and over the years we also incorporated some peripheral sites in, in some of the countries. Next slide please. So in terms of how we did the training, so it was a trainer of trainer approach, um, which was the master trainers then cascaded the training to the different institutions. Uh, we trained in uh, balanced non-coercive counselling in, in all available methods. Um, so there were really two parts of training, the counselling and then the insertion part to the training. And that was using uh, the Kelly's forceps, using it on Mama U models. So we started off with theoretical uh, lectures, followed by practice on dummies and then followed by um, hands on super, uh, supervised insertion of uh, PPIUD in, in women. And the countries had varied from perhaps five to ten insertions before the person was considered accredited. So in terms of our key highlights of training, um, uh, Dr. Hema Devakar will tell you all about task, share, task sharing, so I won't dwell on that. On the job training, uh, Dr. Kusum Tapa spoke about that last week, and you can see the recording um, if you missed it. Um, and also uh, Professor Munganizi spoke about pre-service training, again, it'll be on the recording. So for those interested in the materials that were used, you can fi find that on the GLOBE website. And when you get these slides, uh, when we finished, uh, you can click, that's a hyperlink, so it'll take, take you directly to the materials. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so again, I won't dwell on this, but this just shows the distribution of um, types of uh, cadre of health who were doing the insertion across the six countries and you can see there it varied in terms of available staff and, and, and the function of each each staff in maternity units but in Sri Lanka nearly all insertions were done by doctors the dark green line whereas for example if we move back up the graph to Tanzania and Kenya you can see in the African countries actually the vast majority of insertions were performed very safely by uh, midwives and nurses. Thank you next slide. Um, so this slide is just showing you the distribution or the number of people who we trained in each of the countries. You can see they're divided by country. In total, we trained over 9,000 providers uh, to counsel and insert PPIUD. And then on top of that, we trained uh, people also just to do uh, uh, counselling, so um, comprehensive counselling on, on, on all methods. So over 12,000 trained, trained to do that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, our service delivery, maybe the first thing to say is that uh, in phase two, we had a very comprehensive data collection system. So we had data collection officers doing exit interviews on all, wom all women who delivered across our sites um, and also uh, interviewing those who had who decided to opt for the PPIUD, they then uh, were interviewed at their six week follow up for those who came. So uh, we also had data safety monitoring uh, boards set up in each of the countries and we performed audits of structure and process on a six monthly basis. Um, so what we were able to demonstrate was a very low infection rate, uh, zero perforation rates and expulsion rates, which were very similar to that of the interval IUD. So around 3%, just under 3%. And this was using um, this Kelly's forceps uh, 
to ensure a high fundal pl placement of the IUD. So this was key to keeping expulsion rates down. If you, if you don't succeed in putting the IUD in the fundus of the uterus, then the expulsion rates go up. And, um, and I think that's why there are some reports in the literature of high expulsion rates. So in, in terms of the highlights, um, uh, Professor Parveen will be talking to you about dedicated family planning uh, counsellors that they used in Bangladesh. Um, Dr. Adongo, Eli Adongo, will be telling you about uh, the community health worker engagement uh, in Kenya also today. And just to mention that we also produced IEC tools, so information education uh, and communication tools, which included actually video messages for women to listen to while they were waiting for their antenatal clinic appointment. We think this also uh, made a big difference to uh, increasing um, uptake. Next slide, please. So these are the results based on our data collection. So you can see that phase one was until the middle of 2015. So the blue line is the number of deliveries. So our phase one was just Sri Lanka. And then from 2015 onwards, we incorporated the other five countries. The orange line is number of women counseled. So as we trained uh, staff in counseling, that uh, increased. And we achieved on average 60% of the ladies who came through those hospitals were counselled on postpartum family planning. And then the grey and the yellow lines are the number of women who consented and, and then had PPIUD inserted, which were roughly the same, although it varied from one place to another. So about 12% of ladies across the board consented to have PPIUD. The next slide, please. And so another important um, component of our initiative was uh, leadership and governance. And so FIGO um, really in all of its projects works towards strengthening um, its member national societies. Um, and in this project, that was no different. So we wanted to strengthen the society so that they could become true advocates for women's health um, with their governments. And you can see the picture of um, the society of, in Sri Lanka um, together with their government on the National Family Planning Day. We also leverages, leveraged FIGO's uh, global influence uh, to change practice on various platforms. And as I mentioned before, the data we collected, so I think that was key. So collecting scientifically sound data meant that we could pull it all together and contribute really to the body of evidence uh, with regards to the value of postpartum family planning and PPIUD. And so we, we've published several articles um, with there's a supplement that's free online, which you can access, which tells you various aspects of, of the initiative in the different countries. Next slide, please. And so this slide really summarizes our theory of change. And so we have the four pillars, leadership and governance, uh, work, changing workforce, um, our service delivery and data uh, collection. And really with these four pillars, we were able to influence health systems so that they were better equipped to provide postpartum family planning, PPIUD services, uh, in turn increasing modern contraceptive rate and in, uh, improving birth spacing and decreasing unintended pregnancies and unsafe abor abortions. And by that, our ultimate goal of reducing maternal mortality and improving perinatal outcomes hopefully was achieved. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in terms of our key learnings, so, so first equality, postpartum family planning um, is counsel uh, counseling is absolutely vital, um, that PPIUD is safe and, and effective. Um, task sharing is, is very important when considering access to the services. Um, champions, I didn't speak much about that, but champions in each of the facilities really made the difference with the, the initiative taking off. And it's, they're not, you can't really predict who those champions will be, but there are people who take it up um, and, 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 and make uh, real changes in their units, which, which um, is highly, very valuable. Um, fifth, uh, community involvement. So Ellie will talk more about that, but the inclusion of partners and husbands in the counselling is key um, in, in, in many of the places we worked. Um, that data is key to driving change. And one of the things that we've been very keen to do in our sustainability phase is, this phase is ensure that governments, that their HMIS systems have been modified so that they are able to collect data on postpartum uh, family planning, uh, counselling and also method choice so that they can understand uh, what the practice is. 
Um, we par uh, partnerships uh, uh, foster sustainability, so working with the national societies and, and the partners on the ground is key. And then lastly, um, that PPFP, PPIUD services, when they're rolled out at scale, are highly cost effective. And this is the subject of the third webinar, webinar next Wednesday. It's a slightly later time, but I urge you to listen to that. It really is quite astonishing how cost effective rolling out these services are. So if you want more information, because this is a quick overview, and um, then with, there's some handouts, um, please download them. And just really left to say thank you very much. This is a huge project which involved many people who unfortunately aren't on that slide. But uh, thank you to all the national societies. Thank you to Professor Arrell who conceived the project and has been with us all the way through it. Uh, to my staff at FIGO headquarters, Emily, Susanna, Annabelle and Catherine have been instrumental. And I just wanted to thank again our anonymous donors for their very generous grant, which I hope we have spent wisely, um, hopefully to improve women's health a little bit more. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Anita, that was a great overview. And again, just to mention that for those interested in learning more about the project overall, there are some materials in the handouts. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hema Divakar from India. Dr. Divakar is a leading medical professional in India and an accomplished specialist in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. She's medical director at the Divakar Specialty Hospital in Bangalore. Dr. Hema Divakar, I welcome you and I turn it over to you. Namaste. I bring you greetings from India and I'm ever grateful to FIGO and in particular our very beloved PPIUD team for giving us some wonderful insights to think out of the box on a method which was already available to us. The two things were the key to drive us very forcefully ahead into this program. One is our great advocacy campaign about how PPIUD is not only about contraception, but more importantly, the advocacy that PPIUD saves lives. And the other important thing was all about the impact of task sharing. Having such rich human resource within us, as in the trained staff nurses, it's a wonderful opportunity to explore this cadre of frontline healthcare workers to do more to enhance and expand the PPIUD. Next. The context becomes all the more important because Anita has already mentioned that because of the drive towards institutional deliveries, it is the greatest one point contact with the women out there who so very much need to have a contraceptive method in place. And what better an opportunity than to counsel them during their pregnancy for a PPIUD so that they and their family have enough time to make up their minds and give us the consent. And within few minutes after delivery, the contraceptive is in place, helping her to have a quality of life and space her children. When we had the poll at the beginning of the session, only 17% said, hmm, we are thinking perhaps that we may have this method incorporated into our practice. Well then, it is time now for us to reflect, revisit and retrospectively think how much more we could have done with this method and better late than never, the second best chance is here and now. Many of the centers may have a doctor, may not have a doctor at the time that the woman is delivering, but they will definitely be a frontline healthcare provider, as in a nursing staff or a qualified trained person to deliver the babies and the potential that we have in empowering her to insert a PPIUD within minutes after delivery is a great opportunity indeed. Next. We embarked on this program through our parent organization, Foxy, which is one of the largest organization in the world, consisting of 35,000 specialist gynecologists in partnership with the Avni Health Foundation, which have always stood in support for the key implementation aspects. Six major teaching hospitals 
north, east, west, and south. So India is a big country. So we wanted to experiment with this initiative right across the length and breadth of the country to see what works and how it works. Through the period of January 2015 to December 2018, the staff were trained to offer the family planning counseling and the services, and we embarked on demonstrating how the task sharing with the nurses to provide the PPIUD services to the women gave access to an expanded pool of women with convenience and safety. Next. The key is the counseling and the training, because the more the women and the family are sensitized that this is a safe and a long term method, which is really good for them. That is one aspect of it and the quality of training, because if we have more number of complications, of course, this method is quick to get into this repute. So the emphasis both on the quality of counseling and the quality of training with the Mama you with creating a mama you station at uh, a corner of a institute where each one teach one was the rule and every day the practice sessions because once is not enough they have to get it right and every time every woman every delivery the right things of fundal placement and aseptic precautions need to be followed this was underscored underlined and emphasized next the impact when we started, the acceptance of this was hardly 2%. And just see the fact that where there is a will, there is a way. And if you empower the women and their families to know what is one of the good options for them, the acceptance rate started scaling up year after year after year, just underlines the value of adequate counseling and reassurance. The scale went up to 52 to 49, 37%. These fluctuations again speak volumes of the fact that if there is enough attention and time given to the counseling, indeed, each and every one of these women requires some form of contraception on the other. So, this is a real good opportunity. The timing of insertions, many a times during the C section, because the specialist was available. And after the vaginal deliveries in the first year, it was only 22%, but you see that rate is scaling up as the years advance, and we will tell you why. Next. The training was offered both to the nurses and the doctors, and the quality, no compromise made, whatever the cadre of healthcare workers was um, in the front line to provide this service. There were very few nurses trained in the first year, but nearly all of them were trained adequately in the second and the third year. And you see 86 to 99 percent. So each and every staff nurse there were empowered and could adequately um, be trained to perform this. So as the years went by, the PPIUD insertion shifted from the doctors to the trained nurses. Next. And you see, one of the institutions took this to their heart. It's a very remote part of East of India, where really many, many deliveries happen. And more than 80% of the deliveries, which are vaginal deliveries, do not have the doctors who are battling with the volumes and complications that they have to deal with, with the N number of other patients that they have. So the nurses took charge and in the JNM hospital in Calcutta in Kalyani, the percentage insertion went up to 40% and the trend was ever increasing year after year. And why and how did this happen? Next. You will see a very interesting data that more number of normal vaginal deliveries, more number of insertion by the nurses, but this translated only into the good use of this methodology by task shifting and empowering the nurses in the face of very minimal or nil complications. Whether it was a doctor or whether it was a nurse who did the insertions, if the quality training is offered, they are on par and there is no compromise on the methodology of insertion 
and the complications of expulsion, um, etc., are minimized. So it is worthwhile calling for help for the cadre of the staff nurses, which are amidst us, because this indeed is an opportunity never to be lost. The contact time of the nurse with the patient is by far the greatest when compared to a doctor. And just as an example, if an intravenous line has to be started, a staff nurse is definitely better than the top level consultant. So such is the simplicity of this device. It is just our willingness to train and empower the cadre of staff nurses in the task sharing initiative that is important. Next. Everything may halt during COVID, but not the menstruation and the reproduction. So the healthcare system is really overburdened, especially in our country today. And if these women have to seek contraceptive care going back and forth in the interval period, it is nearly next to impossible and the unmet need will ever expand. Therefore, it is time to pay attention to the PPIUD method for a long-term contraception because every such patient who delivers in the backdrop of the COVID pandemic deserves this as a matter of her right. Next. So the recommendations to recap, PPIUD provides the women the additional advantage of leaving the hospital with appropriate long-term contraception after an institutional delivery, which is now very common in most of our LMIC countries. And also it decreases the cost borne by them and the government. Training the nurses who conduct the delivery is a really good idea worth exploring to insert the PPIU series and it has to be included in the programs as they help to increase women's access to PPIUD services without jeopardizing the quality of care. Following this study, we recommended that the strategy be taken up by other units when nurses conduct the vaginal delivery. Last slide. We gratefully acknowledge the India Ministry of Health and Welfare, the six sites and the leadership for doctors and nurses as well, the Abni Health Foundation staff that implemented the project alongside our organization, Foxy, and of course, last but not the least, Professor Sir Arul Kumaran, Dr. Anita Matkins, and the PPIUD FIGO team for their patience, guidance, and support. Thank you very much. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hema. That was fantastic and an excellent example of the impact of task sharing on, on PPIUD. Uh, wonderful. I would, now like to in, I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Benjamin uh, Odongo Eli from Kenya. Dr. Eli is an obstetrician and gynecologist uh, and oncologist with 20 years of experience in clinical practice. And he is currently the head of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at the Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital. Dr. Odongo, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present in this webinar. I am Dr. Eli. I'm the current president of COGS, Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society and the past national coordinator of the FIGO PPIUD project. I will be presenting on working alongside partners, the partners being community health volunteers during the implementation of the PPIUD initiative. Next slide. His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya introduced Free maternity care in the year 2013, the June of 2013, which abolished the use of uh, user fees for any services that are related to maternal health. This led to skilled birth delivery and also led to contraceptive prevalence rate and also to, to, to increased uptake of postnatal care. However, despite this good gesture by the government of Kenya, we still have disparities at both national and rural levels. 
whereby there is disparity in terms of uh, socioeconomic inequities, and uh, only half of uh, mothers residing in rural areas still receive skilled birth as, as compared to 82% in urban areas, and unmet need of family planning is also higher in rural areas as compared to urban areas. Next slide. Yeah, in order to reach the grassroots with health messages in Kenya, the population has been organized into community health units. And each community health unit has a catchment area of around 5,000 persons. And these community health units are served by volunteers, which whom we also refer to community health volunteers. Their main role include messaging for primary health care services and also for maternal and child health services. And they are usually the link between the households and the peripheral health care systems. Next slide. So who are these community health uh, volunteers? They are uh, respected persons, also known as community all resource persons. They are drawn from the communities and they are equipped with their uh, basic education. However, they still have to undergo basic training in health, uh, in areas of primary health. And they act as food soldiers in, a, in, in, in a really akin to where there is no doctor. There is evidence that community health volunteers, they make an improvement in priority areas which include nutrition, immunization, maternal health, et cetera. Next slide. From my foregoing remarks, we now know that community health volunteers bridge the gap between the community and the health facilities. They also create demand for the use of the health facilities as captured in one quote from the community health volunteer in Nakuru County who stated that you can have a state-of-the-art health facility staffed with highly trained health workers, but if no one is using it, you will not see results. Next slide. That is the map of the Republic of Kenya, whereby we are a 50 million, a population of 50 million with 47 administrative counties. The PPID initiative was implemented in six counties, Initially, the, 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 the initiative was facility-based, but in, during the project implementation, we realized that in order to create demand for the PPID services, we had to reach the communities where the women come from. And from this, we leveraged on the government of Kenya's community health strategy, during which we also had to develop the, the training package for the community health volunteers. Next slide. Yeah, in the next couple of slides, I will delve deeper into how we implemented, how we partnered with the community health volunteers. The main challenge we have experienced in this country is prolonged industrial action by healthcare workers, whereby we have had a, a prolonged, we had a prolonged strike period lasting for close to a year. We also noted that there was low male involvement. And in this part of the world, the males are the main decision makers. And this resulted in a reduce in a low acceptance of family planning and also high removal rates. So with the, with the foregoing uh, uh, factors, we realized that there was no counseling going on or it was suboptimal counseling going on. And therefore we had to, to resort to to, to more innovative ways, and that involved the use, the involvement of the CHVs. Next slide. So the community health volunteers were selected from the community, and they underwent a two-day training, and they were issued with uh, with a, uh, the, the, a manual which they could use for counseling at the household levels. Let me mention in this country all pregnant mothers or almost all pregnant mothers are issued with a mother baby booklet and this booklet serves as a, a record of the progress of the pregnancies so when the chvs were trained they were also issued with a stamp so when they went into a household they could stamp the, the and document the encounter 
of counseling for, for PPFP. From the, the picture you, should, you see there is our first president, Dr. Kihara, training the, the, the CHVs in one of our sites. Next, next slide. Yeah, so the client education materials that were used we were also translated into the local languages. So for ease of communication and for ease of acceptance from where, uh, by, the, by the various communities. Next slide. So what was the impact of involvement of health, of community health volunteers? We trained over 568 CHVs and over 56,000 households were reached with their postpartum family planning information, out of which over 90,000 uh, women were counseled for family planning. We also looked at our data to determine whether there was an impact before or after engagement of the CHVs. And we found that the likelihood of a woman receiving counseling was higher, actually 19% higher, as of, uh, after the involvement of C after involvement of CHVs. Next slide. Yeah, we must not underestimate the role that community health volunteers play in promoting the uptake of family planning uh, in, in, in this part of the world. And integrating the CHWs into health system has actually been one of the proven high impact uh, interventions. The challenge we still face is uh, incorporating the CHVs into the mainstream of uh, civil service uh, civil service system whereby they should be compensated for their work and the time that they do. So we must also ensure that we establish them as part of core healthcare, or core providers of health of healthcare, since they demystify the healthcare system to the population. Next slide. I must acknowledge Professor Sa Arul and Figo for considering Kenya in this initiative, Dr. Anita and the Figo HQ team for their support and the guidance they provided during the project implementation. The Kenya Ministry of Health and the county governments they provided the platform for which we implemented this project. Of course, the society and the project staff and the secretarial staff were indefatigable during the implementation. And lastly, to all the women who came under our care, from whom a lot of lessons was learned. Next slide. Well, thank you very much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. That was an excellent presentation and very interesting to hear the impact of community health workers, not only on service provision, but also increasing demand for the postpartum IUD. Just a reminder to our audience to please enter your questions in the box on the right-hand side. Uh, and if you have a question for a specific panelist, please indicate that as well. I would now like to welcome our final presenter, uh, Professor Dr. Parveen Fatima from Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Fatima is currently the Vice President of Endometriosis Society of Bangladesh and past Vice President of uh, OGSB. She is the coordinator uh, for the P Vigo PPIUD initiative in Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Parveen, I turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the National Co Coordinator of Bangladesh, Vigo PPIUD project of Bangladesh. Today, my mission is on the need for quality uh, counseling its impact on PPID uptake in Bangladesh. As you know, Bangladesh is the eighth most populous country in the world. Unintended pregnancy accounts for approximately one third of all pregnancies. And the unmet overall unmet need of the country is 12%. Next slide, please. So uh, when with the FIGO initiative in Bangladesh in January 2015, the FIGO PPID program was started and it was implemented in six tertiary level teaching hospitals across four major cities in Bangladesh. Three centers were in uh, Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, and um, three were select three other places were selected on the unmet need of the country 
in Dhaka, the unmet need is 12%, and whereas the unmet need of Silet was uh, 18%, and the unmet need of Chittagong was uh, 17%, and the unmet, these two are high um, unmet need areas, but we matched with Pulna, where the unmet need was below the national figure. It was 9% unmet need in, at Pulna. So uh, we selected the places like that because all the indices in Kulna was high, even the insertion was also high in Kulna and Silet. Uh, and Silet also showed a great progress. The unmet need of overall Bangladesh at the time when we decided to do the program was like this, but uh, the record of 2018 shows the unmet need in Dhaka is now 12.3%. The unmet need of Silet has come down to 13.8%, but the unmet need at Chittagong is 18%. That means uh, possibly the intrusion of Rohingya has created this. There is no decline in, in Chittagong. The unmet need at uh, Kulna has uh, decreased to 8.5% uh, in the year 1918's record is like this. So. Uh, this is the scenario of our um, areas where we have started this project. Thank you. Next slide, please. So regarding implementation approach, how did we do this? With the gradual increase in institutional delivery, which is now 50% of the deliveries are operating in the institute, there is now scope of counseling and providing PPID services during their hospital stay as the women are um, the um, women may not return to the facility following delivery for contraceptive service so this was the opportunity for us to um, uh, when we got the program we uh, we tried with this uh, implementation approach so that uh, first of all we recruited the postpartum family planning counselors and the OBGYN in the uh, service areas where the, they give the maternity service, they were not at all involved in giving any uh, contraceptive advice to the patient except in the tubal ligation. As you know, Bangladesh has two separate governments, uh, two separate divisions. Uh, one is for the health service where the hospitals are run and there the OBGYNs are not, uh, were not involved in this. But the family planning sector is involved and that is a separate division. We were working for the institute, so we intruded in the hospital sites, which was much needed. And this program has given us the scope to um, train our OBGYN with very important part of uh, life skill that is um, the PPID as well as the other methods of contraceptions. And the dedicated counselor that we took, they were responsible for continuous data collection and reporting. In addition to their counseling and continuous skill-based training also was also done in the six project areas because there were new people coming for training, new people joined there. So the, uh, for them, the trainings were always uh, scheduled as well as the there was um, uh, training for the person who were uh, already trained to find out what they are doing. And the most important part was to go with the government to make them feel that this particular procedure, because the, of, uh, the institutional delivery is increasing and the scope of doing the things in the institute when they are coming to us is a priority for us. So we try to advocate this message to the Ministry of Health Service and the family planning also and the NGOs and the other stakeholders. We usually sat with them we talked with them, and when the uh, FIGO um, uh, personnel came for the visit, we also tried to uh, get a meeting so that we could make them understand. Now they know that this is a very important 
thing that must be implemented and possibly the, um, this will be going uh, um, rolling in with the uh, government thank you next slide please so the our experience in implementing ppid service in bangladesh uh, the initiative ran in two phases from 2015 and it is still continuing up to October 2020. Initially, OBGYN were trained in family planning, counseling and insertion and uh, on the postpartum IUCD during normal delivery as well as cesarean sections. Counselors were employed for counseling and data collection. With the rollout of the new Bangladeshi midwifery cadre in 2018, a new scope came out and uh, here also we intruded with the, um, uh, with the help of PIGO, we could um, train the midwifery faculty. Our intention was the next generation midwives must know what is PPID, what are the different contraceptives. So we, uh, uh, we ask them to the uh, uh, sector in their midwifery uh, curriculum, which was in, included in their curriculum. And then we trained the 38th Institute of Midwives, the faculties of those institutes regarding uh, this counseling and the PPID insertions. And uh, they have given the next generation uh, midwives are now being trained. In addition to that, we trained 275 nurses and midwives when they were um, in the in-service job. So we continued the thing with the midwifery category and um, total number of insertion done up till now was 15,355 insertion with informed consent. We, uh, we counseled the OM as well, and with their consent only, we introduced it. And so our counselor were uh, um, responsible for this. And uh, the, start, uh, the finding shows that their counseling has given us a good scope to um, in, uh, give, in, give these insertions because IUCD had a very bad, a bad name in the country. Uh, although contraceptive prevalence rate is 62 in the country, but uh, only 0.6% of the uh, um, uh, method of modern contraception is for uh, IUCD. So we were lacking behind in insertion of IUCD. And regarding follow-up, the follow-up was um, in our country because of uh, distance and the, uh, and when the baby is born, they don't want to come live, um, to bring the child, they feel difficult. So uh, that was initially a problem we felt, but later on we could, we included telephonic um, uh, follow-up and face-to-face -face and telephonic follow-up, we could reach up to 65%. And the removal, perforation, and infection minimum among our clients. There was not a single case of perforation. Uh, so we were happy because the bad name of IUCD, interval IUCD was for perforation. Thank you. The next slide, please. So the results, what? we have done throughout this time. Uh, in the six institutes, uh, 220,638 uh, 2, deliveries uh, occurred and 84% of the uh, deliveries, we have um, patients in the clients, we could counsel them and we got consent from for taking PPID in only 9.2% of the council uh, clients and we could do insertion. These are the requests uh, of only those six institutes. In addition to the six institutes, we went, we had phases and we went to the branches of ODSP, 
we went to the midwifery category so those insertions are not being included over here um, the, in the six institutes we had 14,791 insertions uh, that is about 86% of those consented was had the insertion and um, others were because some of the patient who gave the consent didn't come for delivery in the hospital or for some medical reason or some other reason we couldn't give it uh, next slide please Regarding quality counseling uh, to provide women with knowledge on the choice of their uh, method to help women understand the choice of birth limitation and birth spacing, um, these were done by our done by our counselor and our uh, doctors also tried to give some time, but because of the busy schedule they couldn't do. But the main workload was with the counselor. To inform her about different forms of effective contraceptions to help her make an informed choice about whether to use contraception and if so which particular method suits her give the opinion woman a chance to ask questions which is very important because if they get the proper answer they are more confident to take the um, uh, method sufficient in information about contraceptive methods regarding effectiveness correct use, common adverse effects, high risks and benefits, and sign symptoms when they should uh, come back to the clinic for help. All these were very important uh, uh, thing for, uh, and, uh, for counseling. And with those good counseling, the patient were very happy to take the uh, method and the persons who Took the method were very well satisfied when we questioned them so that is the impact of quality counseling next next please why are dedicated counselor needed in bangladesh contraceptive service were not a priority for service providers in hospital during maternity care and it was rarely highlighted in prenatal checkups only tubectomy service during cesarean section were done and there were no counselors nobody um, and that busy sh um, schedule of the doctors and nurses they couldn't do uh, give them the time and patience to hear and say them about the thing so at the government facility there were no counselor and the OBGYN nurses are uh, have the daily workload a dedicated family planning counselor can build a rapport and give all the um, uh, understanding about the contraceptive methods to the client. Through a comfortable relationship with the counselor, the client were more uh, willing to take the method and they uh, could speak what they wanted to know. The counselor has time to use the audio visuals that we uh, developed in, uh, in our own language and the uh, uh, to make the client understand the safety and the complications of each contraceptive method. So, uh, the next slide, please. So, the barriers to implementation. Uh, low antenatal family planning counseling rates, because during the antenatal period, the counseling for family planning was very uh, almost nil in our facilities as they were very busy the high uh, patient load was the reason also and uh, and the uh, women uh, needed the care for the pregnancy and they were also not um, at that time we were not focusing on that provider in misperception on IUCD was also an important thing Still now, when we uh, went for implementation in the six um, institutes, we found not all the providers have the same intentions. Everybody in the, if there were six departments, all the six were not effectively using IUCD. So uh, it was difficult to uh, manage that also slowly when they found, because initially their uh, understanding about the IUCD was quite different and they used to think that will create problem nuisance to their patients 
and especially during um, just after delivery, what uh, infection can happen. Now, there were so many of queries, but with time that has reduced. Lack of doctors, I think that is also a big issue because one counseling of doctor is uh, not talked for by the uh, counselors, but the um, but this um, this has to be done. Uh, doctors must talk, and the nurses must talk, and slowly maybe we will be able to do this. And the follow-up rates are very low because uh, the the place where they come for delivery, they uh, maybe that is their mother's place. When they go to their uh, in-laws, they cannot come for the distance and all those things. And this uh, family planning awareness, family planning awareness, women's decision making power is also very important because uh, they, with education and uh, understanding, they will be able. And uh, the family also creates problem. The uh, most, uh, don't want the method. All uh, uh, women gets fear about the particular inside them. So the, these and the myths and religious belief, um, which are now being erased, uh, we are trying to erase. These were our barriers for inciting yet initially, but we have overcome almost on a lot. So recruitment of counselor for the PPID initiative. A dedicated counselor were recruited in September 2015, and the counselors were trained by an Indian uh, uh, trainers, and uh, that was for four days. And um, uh, and after that, they were quite confident. Initially, we trained them, but um, after the training of the um, people coming for training from India, a study on the showed recruitment and training uh, and training of the dedicated counselor did not have any impact on PPID insertion rate. However, it reduced the rate of removal on follow-up. That a better understanding of the method uh, erases the uh, question of removal at follow-up. So that was our main um, uh, uh, findings that insertion rate did not increase, but uh, retention rate was higher after um, counselor went about the counseling program. Next slide, please. So the, uh, what was our counseling steps? We did several counseling steps. Uh, in the during the antimonatal visit, the number came. We did the counseling. We never left them. That uh, our counselor used to talk with them whether they they have any questions on, and uh, they were again reminded about the thing. And the uh, persons who um, who want, accepted the method, they were um, their record was in the visible in the. Um, in their antenatal card, women um, agreed uh, was uh, was uh, and came for facility uh, delivery where uh, visual you know, evaluation reevaluation was done at the time of labor when uh, when uh, about the consent whether their consent is still there. We never did any. If anybody refused to uh, take it, we we used to stop the procedure there. We didn't move on. Insertion was done by providers if no contraindication. So we also evaluated whether there is any problem which can uh, be a problem for her. So if there was PPH, we stopped. If there was any other problem, we uh, di we didn't insert them. So. Next slide, please. The challenges that we faced during insertion and during follow-up. 
during the um, clients withdrew their consent because they were scared of the technique, scared of their family's view, the in, uh, mother-in-law and the husband uh, um, maybe not present while they were counseled. Even when they were present, they may the lady may be have a different view. Misinformed regarding use of uh, contraception that prevailed in the community, and not only that, as Muslim, the Malanas used to tell that um, with a with a device you cannot be buried. Your burial will not be there. So these things has to be erased. So these things created a little problem for uh, insertion. And some of the patients opted for bilateral tubal ligation, where ligation was done. And during follow-up, lost their PPI. They didn't bring the card, so uh, identification was a little difficult again. Um, so, and not aware about follow-up, they didn't understand the importance. And they didn't come. One to remove because of family pressure, Miss follow up appointment, fearing confidentiality. They didn't want to, uh, if other people know that she has put it there. Uh, the ICD contact number was also a big problem when we uh, uh, went for telephone um, follow up. Then not answered. There was uh, different numbers. Somebody uh, other than the patient answered. Uh, avoid follow up because of distance. Some of them didn't come up for because they shifted to some other places. So these were the challenges that we had to face during the follow-ups. The next slide, please. So um, we, government has employed midwives. It was a recent uh, uh, thinking and in 2018, the midwives were um, appointed. So most routine deliveries are conducted by OBGYN, not conducted by the OBGYNs because uh, deliveries, uh, they are not always present. The junior doctors has to uh, do it. So now when the, this particular cadre of people are in the labor room, the deliveries are being um, attended better. Um, because the OB, uh, they can do the normal deliveries. Higher rate of PPID insertion at cesarean section was also a, a thing because during cesarean sections, the um, gynecologist uh, um, was there and they uh, did the uh, insertions. And during uh, normal delivery, there was less number of insertion because they were not available there. The trained persons were not available. So with the midwifery cadre, uh, that will be erased. Expanding to new midwife cadre can increase access to women having a vaginal delivery. Midwives also able to support counseling uh, efforts. These midwives are asked and they are trained for counseling. And, um, and thirty no, 37% had normal delivery and 63% had cesarean section while they were given the uh, IUCD. Please change the slide. Working with midwives, we were very happy to find with midwives uh, in support of the government costed implementation plan, which calls for all facility with deliveries to have midwives trained in family planning counseling because that is more cost effective. As I told that we trained the master trainers uh, regarding the postpartum family planning counseling and the PPID insertion in 38 midwifery institute and the cascade training to midwifery students. Uh, and along with it, we did train the in-service midwives the uh, counseling and uh, PPID insertions, training midwives in service provision, along with the counseling of available postpartum family planning methods, 
could help Bangladesh to accelerate the use of modern contraceptives as well as contribute to a reduction of un, uh, unintended pregnancies. In Bangladesh, in-service midwives are now posted at Upojala Health Complexes where they play a vital role in ensuring women and their quality care during pregnancy and childbirth through the provision of respectful antenatal care, delivery and postnatal care to the women. And in 2020, we trained the 161 in-service midwives working in 24 Upujala health complexes in Dhaka division on postpartum family planning counseling and postpartum ICD insertion. The PPID initiative by working uh, in partnership with midwifery faculties and in-service midwives has ensured that the service provision of postpartum family planning and PPID services outlives our project. So even when we um, stop our project, that will, this will be persisting. These midwives will be taking forward this method and provide women with quality maternity care, increased contraceptive choice, and timely contraceptive services thereafter. Next slide, please. In conclusion, multiple quality counseling opportunities are invaluable in ensuring uh, women are fully informed and make correct choices. With proper com communication and counseling, the clients are guided through focused information. Counseling by trained counselors significantly decrease the removal, discontinuation, and withdrawal of concentrates. So this is also very important that when they understand the, about the method, about the complications, about the um, uh, uh, impact of birth spacing and uh, birth limitation, they give the consent for this and they stay with it. If women are correctly informed about the methods and side effects, they are more likely to accept and continue with their chosen method. Where dedicated counselors are not present, the new midwifery cadre of health in is an opportunity to improve counseling in postpartum family planning, especially in Upojila health complexes. March 2020 Bangladesh CIP also included, includes dedicated family planning counselors as a mechanism to increase family planning uptake. So partnership between different cadres such as OBGYN, nurses and midwives is key to ensuring that women and their babies receive a respectful maternity care throughout pregnancy, birth, and in postnatal care period. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. And thanks to the uh, Bangladesh Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Director General of Family Planning and Director General of Health Services. And due respect to my professor, um, who uh, has included this program in Bangladesh is Professor Arun Kumar Ran. And I thank very much to uh, Dr. Anita Mankis, whose support was always, and the headquarter team. Their support was very much uh, important and valid for us. OGSP Executive Committee, and thanks to the facility coordinator and master trainers of the project of uh, OGSP and uh, FIGO PPID Bangladesh team. And special thanks to our counselors. Without them, possibly I couldn't have done this presentation. And the clients at the facility who um, who came and gave us the consent and who who are happy with the uh, with the insertions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Fatima. That was a very insightful presentation from Bangladesh and clearly the importance of counseling on impact of PPIUD. We have about 10 minutes for questions, so thank you to all that have submitted your questions. I think what I will do is I'm going to start with uh, our first presenter, uh, Dr. Divakar. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of the questions together so I can have you give you an opportunity to respond, and then I'll do the same for the following presenters. Um, so for you, there, there were a number of questions uh, on the task sharing, specifically, you know, when we talk about these task sharing concepts, how do we materialize them into action when the health system or the policies are not necessarily in place? Um, also, there was a question about, have, had you considered in, 
including midwives as part of that training. And then there was a more technical question on why the low insertion after C-sections versus the vaginal deliveries. So let me leave it at that and give you a chance to respond to those questions. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, about how the policy change uh, is in keeping with empowering our frontline uh, healthcare providers. So the sheer volumes of deliveries in low middle income countries like ours, 30 million deliveries with only 30,000 specialists is a, a fact that the numbers don't match and we have to train and empower the entire teams in the hospital. In fact, uh, very recently, the government has signed up with us uh, in a public-private partnership where both in the public facilities and in the private facilities, the staff nurses, as in the teams in various hospitals, are taken through quality training for clinical standards and protocols, and uh, uh, they are empowered to do quite a bit of the task to take it to a meaningful finish because every time, everywhere, the specialist cannot be present and uh, there is a lot that can be done by the task sharing. And about the midwives, the entire cadre of midwives, unfortunately, in the country like India, they have just about embarked on the specialist midwife cadre who are undergoing the first round of training. So it will be another 18 months by the time we have the first few batches out there in the field to actually execute their job as nurse mentors. But until then, several million deliveries will happen. It is time to think differently. It is time to empower the nursing staff with monitoring, supervision, with digital training, re-emphasis, and uh, um, just getting our notice at the right time in a variety of situations where they can do most of the work and that's all about the task sharing and the task shifting concept which is coming to the mainstream now and well accepted and endorsed by both the private and the public sectors and the ministry as well because it really is the answer to the need for the human resources for the capacities to be built the low insertions in c-section vis-a-vis the vaginal deliveries it is not that the c-section had lower insertions it was that the number of c-sections versus the number of vaginal deliveries in a particular setup the kalyani center had about 85 percent of the women delivering vaginally so the number of insertions after the nurses took over the task of insertion they proceeded with the ppiud insertion and the number scaled up the 15% of the total number of deliveries who had the C-section, depending on the consent and the counseling, it was the doctors who were responsible for placing the PPIUD during the C-sections. So the numbers reflect on the volumes of C-section vis-a-vis uh, uh, vaginal um, settings where only the doctors are inserting. And many a times they are not available within 10 minutes after delivery. It's a skilled delivery. And if she is not given either the training or the power to shift the task to her, then it just about gets missed out. So that is the stark difference that we saw in this particular center. That, in fact, has opened our eyes into how much more we can tap this resource and empower them to do a lot more. So the 16 clinical standards in a nationwide program called Manyata now allows the nursing cadre to do 80% of the routine care for the pregnant and the interpartum and the postpartum care. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Divakar, and thank you for being succinct. Um, I, I think Dr. Ellie is having some trouble connecting, so I will wait for him and I will move to, uh, Dr. Parveen, and the questions for you, there, there are many, but, but really around uh, more understanding of the improvement of health-seeking behavior of the mothers with the recruitment of F, the counselors. Um, did you see any improved health-seeking behavior, and do you think that these counselors should be permanently part of the health system? And also some questions on the compensation for these uh, dedicated counselors. 
Were they paid? Were they given certain uh, provisions? Can you talk a little bit about that? Dr. Fatima, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Okay. The counselors uh, that we uh, appointed were paid from the program. And so uh, they worked uh, hard because they used to go to the, not only in the outdoor, they used to go to the indoors and uh, do the work. And um, uh, so uh, your question is for, can you repeat your questions? Yeah, so I, I think people were curious about these dedicated FP counselors, uh, as you said, how were they compensated? Um, and then is there any plans to do a study on seeing was the was the subsequent behavior of women that they counseled had it improved and do the attitudes around uh, contraception improve uh, with the addition of these counselors and also uh, what or is there a plan to have them as permanently as part of the health system yes uh, our government has taken the step of uh, appointing counselors already a few uh, counselors has been taken into uh, given appointment and they are doing counseling they will be uh, not only counseling on family planning they will be counseling in other aspects of maternal health also so uh, uh, dedicated counselor in the institutes will be coming uh, are going to be in, in in our system and that is also one of our achievement that uh, we could um, make them understand that these counselors help uh, um, in, ma uh, in quality maternal health care. So, uh, can I make a. Hello. Uh, Nandita, can I uh, make a comment? Sure. Dr. Parveen, are, are you finished your thought? And then I'll turn it to Dr. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what is her comment? Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we are looking at it a little bit differently in India because uh, we have made a checklist for antenatal care and anybody just about anybody it may be the specialist it may be assistants it may be the interns it may be the junior doctors it may be the staff nurses whoever is offering the antenatal care one of the key parts of the checklist is contraception counseling with a cafeteria choice but in particular PPIUCD because that is an opportunity. So instead of um, uh, creating a cadre of counselors, sometimes which adds on to the burden of the HR and may be available, may not be available, and uh, it's a separate vertical. Instead of that, our vision is to integrate it into a routine part of the antenatal care to have a hundred percent coverage of the counseling for contraception for every single antenatal woman. And if she opts not to choose the PPIUD, it is also one of the standard, standard 15 of the postpartum care. So it's a double emphasis on whoever is interacting with the patient. They sensitize them thoroughly, the need and the options available. Yes, but our workforce of nurses and doctors are still a little less they cannot cover um, the outdoor uh, antenatal care schedule of uh, patient coming is a lot. They cannot give time for more than two, three month, minutes. The nurse is also there beside the doc, uh, doc to see the blood pressure and see the weight height. And, uh, it's a very big rush still, but uh, while we went through the program, we uh, asked our midwives to do the counseling and our nurses to do the counseling. We taught them also the counseling. So when the midwifery cadre will be with us, huh, uh, they will be helping us with that. So your uh, vision uh, about it is all right, but because we don't have the midwifery uh, workforce still to cover our hospitals, only a uh, few midwives is because it's a new provision in the um, system so only few uh, upajalas are having midwives only 161 midwives is appointed in 24 upajala what about the rest 500 places oh um but for the time being because until the upajalas are covered we we'll, in the district will not get people to work in addition to that but 
we are asking while we gave the training we have asked our nurses our uh, doctors to talk something about counts uh, counseling about um, ppid and let us see what happens because if there is a drop um, then we will be a little um, unhappy with it we have trained around 2200 uh, gynecologists about the thing and they are working in the districts and uh, places they know how to give the PPID, do it, know the counseling. Let us see the change there also. But uh, in addition, because we found the uh, counselors in our particular system um, very helpful. Initially, we did um, these busy doctors didn't even some of the doctors. What I uh, told you initially that if there is six in it, three in it would have been telling, oh, it's useless for us. We don't have time. This weather thing but now when we have proved that it benefits the omen and the omens um, the um, needs and um, uh, misunderstanding about the methods because when we give our client the, the choice we go give them the cafeteria to them whatever is available we tell the advantage disadvantage of all and we because it is something the for institutional delivery because if we ask them, okay, you come for oral pill after six months, or you come for post progesterone contraceptive, by the time they come back, they will be pregnant again. So this was a very good option for us that immediately we could do something. So we were in, um, doing that. And if um, let us see what our counselors uh, can do. And also we have asked counseling to be done by the doctor center nurses also yeah. great so thank you the part thank, throughout the thank, process okay yes, thank you th Thank you both. Um, I know we are at time, but we still have a number of questions and there are still some participants on the line. So let me see if we can get Dr. Ellie with us and direct a question to him which is about uh, the, the work that you presented on the community health workers. Did you notice, uh, w was there an impact on engaging more young people in um, supporting the use of family planning, whether IUD or other methods? So if you could talk a little bit uh, from the work in Kenya about engaging young people as part of this initiative. And let's see if we can get him. Dr. Ellie, are you there? Could you repeat the question? Sure. The question of is, did, was was the work with the community health volunteers and health workers in Kenya, was there an impact on engaging young people as part of that initiative? And did they find that there was an interest in postpartum family planning among younger women? Did no. Okay. I, d I don't think we are able to get him on the line, uh, but we can certainly share the questions with all of our presenters. Uh, I think at this time, perhaps we can wrap up. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our presenters for their excellent presentations. We really heard about the impact of this initiative, particularly around task sharing, engaging community health workers, and the importance of uh, family planning counseling. Again, before we close, just a reminder that the webinar will be recorded and you can access it on the FIGO website or the WHO Media HRP YouTube channel. We will be sending the presentations to all of the participants, so you will be able to get the slides. Um, and please do visit our websites for additional information. Next. Uh, remember, this, this webinar today is part of a series uh, I think Anita mentioned the first webinar that was held last week, and we have the final webinar, which will be held next Wednesday at the same time, uh, or a little later, sorry. Uh, the focus will be on global perspectives on the cost effectiveness of the postpartum family planning. So please do register. Again, all the webinars are being recorded and can be accessed on the FIGO website, as well as the HRP media channel. 
next. With that, we would like to thank you all for your participation. Thank you again to our presenters and wish you all an enjoyable rest of your day. And we hope to see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.